so much for Jesus and the blessing that he gives you and the freedom of just letting go. Thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Of the moment when God shows up 
And he gives the kind of supernatural deliverance that leaves everyone standing in awe of him. That's the miracles I like. That's God. And then the miracles of movement in which God transforms a people, a nation, a culture through his influence by his redeemed children. That's a movement. And I'm believing for God for both of them at Meadowland. And here's why I say that. I'm asking him for both miracles and I'm asking him to start right now. I'm asking that we get broke free of old dead, old shackles, old ways of thinking, and just get away from what was and be what God is and what we will be. I'm talking about from Meadowland to the promised land. And if we are faithful and diligent, we will not only break free from those shackles of death, we will be set free to do things for the gospel of Jesus Christ for any and all whosoever who ever walk through this door or they may never come here, but we'll be able to do for them out there in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm also asking that we grow. We grow as a healthy, purpose-driven, God-visioned and centered church that would transform our community and culture simply through the good news of Jesus Christ. If you're here today, who doesn't need good news? I'd love some good news. How about you? Yeah. I'd love some good news. I'd take some. Now, if I only had people who were ready to go out and bear some good news to some people, okay? So when you leave today, know that there's somebody out there that needs some good news just like you did. And don't be afraid to share it. I want to start with Israel. If you want to, turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and we'll be doing verses 1 through 4. These people had escaped bondage. We know about the plagues. We know what Moses had done, the ten plagues, the nation of Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh had said, all right, you guys can go. And it said they escaped in the night without haste. And they headed east, okay? And they were coming up against this insurmountable obstacle. Two million of God's people between the Red Sea and an Egyptian army. I don't know if you understand this or not. When you've got nowhere to go, things can look pretty bad real quick. When you run out of options, you start to panic, don't you? It says they needed a miracle, and they needed it right in the moment. They're between the Red Sea and the Egyptians. Basically. Let's pick up in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. It says, so the Israelites camped there as they were told. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Piharoth between the Michnol and the sea opposite Baal Zephon and you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, and that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Everything that happens will always be for the glory of God, and so that others will see the glory of God and not us. You see, God had set his people free from Egypt, and as they were fleeing and leaving, Pharaoh had changed his mind, and so he began to pursue them and want to bring them back into captivity, back into slavery. And he had decided that he was no longer going to set them free, but to return them back to where they were. But God had other plans. Notice God wasn't dependent on the people of Israel. He was dependent on no one but who? Himself, so that his name would be glorified in Egypt. He knew what he was going to do with the Israelites. It was Egypt where he wanted his name because they didn't believe in God. And he was getting ready to let them know who God was. When you're caught in a tight spot, always look for God to show himself. Am I, am I preaching to the choir today there or what? Every time I've ever been in a tight spot, God has always shown up and he's always shown out. It may not be the way I want it. It may not be the answer that I was looking for, but God did show up and he took charge of the situation. Sometimes I ran praising his name and sometimes I tucked my tail because the whip had hurt so bad that God needed to give me so that I would learn. It says here in scripture, it said that God had planned this in order to display his glory. Some of us look at our circumstances. Some of us look at our, our struggles and our trials and we say, why God? Rather than saying God's going to use this to glorify his name, whether it's in me, whether it's in my family, whether it's in my friends, my sphere of influence, but somebody's going to glorify God through this. When speaking to uh, Gail and Mike Horney this week, her sister had passed. And she's been fighting for a long time. We've kept in close communication. 
And one of the things that she told me was that she is always thankful for our prayers and continued prayers. She didn't like that her sister was sick. She didn't like that her sister was going through things. And at one point it even said, I wish I could take this off of her. We may not understand, but we can always come to the agreement that God's going to use even suffering to His glory. And there's a lot of other things that go on to that story that I'm not going to share somebody else's blessing, but I know this. God used that to bring another situation about. And so God deserves the glory for that. When God's instructions don't make sense, obey them anyway. If you've recently put something together, nowadays they've made it easy for everybody. They color code it, they use small words, they give you 13 different languages because it's going to 13 different countries, and then you look at the pictures, and then you look at the directions, and none of it makes sense. And you just say, you know what, I can do this, I can put this together. How many people have ever felt like that? I can do this, I can put this together. I don't know which is worse. The fact that I know that I can't, I'm going to try or the other fact that somebody else standing there can and they're watching me just to see how bad I mess up. I, I, I don't want to pick on a lot of people, but I just want to drive the point home. When God gives you instructions and they don't make sense, do them anyway. You understand? Do them anyway. It says in Exodus chapter 14, let's do the 5 through 12. It says, Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this? Why have we let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt were captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them by camping by the sea beside Pi-Peroth before bel Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the Israel, children of Israel cried out. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we would serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Isn't it amazing? God has come through and set them free from slavery. He's got them out of Egypt. They're no longer slaves. They walk out in freedom. And then they come to their first big challenge, the Red Sea. They can't get across, and they look behind, and not only are the Egyptians pursuing them, there's 600 chariots coming to get them. Egyptians as far as the eye can see. And so when we first start getting into a little bit of struggle, we immediately think we've made the wrong choice. God's not with us. He's not for us. And surely we can't get out of this, and we have a second thought. How many people love when you go to plan B? You're ready for plan B because none of your plan A's have ever worked in your life. If you're like me, i got a plan C. Because I know nothing I've ever prepared is going to work. Trusting in God is always the first thing. To trust Him, to believe Him, and know that no matter what, He's not only going to persevere, there's reasons for everything that's going to happen. Yet we have a tendency to look at our circumstance rather than our Savior. When we look at our Savior, our circumstances fade. They grow strangely dim because what the Savior can do will always outweigh what our circumstances will do. Amen? When your situation's most desperate, don't look back. They were leaving Egypt. Why look back? I know you're at the Red Sea, but quit looking back. God always brought you from there to here. And I promise you, He's going to take you from here to there. It says, you're always going to be distracted. You're always going to be detoured. And you're always going to get, de get delayed. How many people get upset when things don't happen as quickly as you'd like to? Case in point, I'm frustrated when I look on the back of the box and put it in the microwave and it's longer than two minutes. This is going to take entirely longer than I had hoped. My wife will always tell me, hey, I'm cooking, so it should be ready by the time you get home. I'm like, what is this, like 7.30 a.m.? She goes, yeah, I need you to get home tonight. Y'all ever heard of the slow cooker? I think Melissa owns the slowest cooker. I'm just kidding, honey. She, I'm just kidding. Please do not destroy me today. And I can smell it before I can work. 
eat it. Yeah, I can smell it before I taste it. I can smell it. So all that does is make me want it even more. But if the truth is, if I ate it before it was done, it wouldn't be what? As good. Patience is key when following God. You will be distracted. You will get distracted. You'll get deployed. And you'll get to the point where you think, man, I'm desperate. <laughs> I didn't want to do this. I'm delayed. This is taking longer than I thought. And so we give up on God and start relying on self. That's a bad exchange. As soon as you start relying on self, you will always ruin what God has wanted you to have. Now notice I said, ruin what God wanted you to have. You can never ruin God's plan. Did you know that? You don't have that kind of power. You can't ruin God's plan. You can delay them in your life by being, I don't know how we say it in our own, stubborn. Anybody here stubborn? I wouldn't use the other word, but we're in church. Sometimes we just want our way, and what God does is He lets you have it. When He lets you have your way, you see that your way wasn't really good. One of the things we were thankful for in Sunday school's class this morning was this. How many people are so glad that God never answered your prayer to bring a specific person back into your life? I don't have enough hands to raise for that. But then I had to think, wonder how many times people are thankful I didn't return back into their life. <laughs> Second best will always look inviting when the very best is just out of reach. Second best will always look inviting when the very best is just out of reach. They had tasted freedom. They were at the sea. They were being pursued. And so they thought to themselves, we would be better off back where we were because even though we were enslaved, we weren't getting killed, at least we had food. Never return to where God sets you free from. God didn't stand you up on your feet to walk out of to have you turn around and go back. You can't be a new person in an old place. You can't be changed if you return to those things. Too many people quit just before the dream becomes a reality. Just before the gene becomes a reality. They quit. They give in too soon. One of the best lessons in life I've learned is just don't quit. Just don't quit. I don't care what you're doing. Just don't quit doing it. If you want to see change, if you want to see results, is you keep on even if nobody keeps on with you. And that's the hardest thing. For some of you, what you're doing right now, maybe you're launching a business. Maybe you're trying to go back to school. Maybe you're thinking about having another kid. You're thinking of all these reasons of why not to and what not to do. And maybe people don't believe in what you're doing, but you feel called by God to do these things. Trust me, when everybody else quits and gives in, don't. If you've got God God's blessing, trust that He'll bring it through. It may take time, it may take seasons, it may take years, but you will have what God has promised. Most people stop just short of success and they try to reconsider their path because wisdom has been revealed from God and they think they know better. I know this, God won't bless sin. Do you agree with that this morning? Some of you are here today asking God to bless your plans when your plans are sin. And God doesn't bless sin. Will He allow sin? Yes. Will He allow you to mess up? Yes. Will He wait for your return? Yes. Can He be forgiven? Yes. Double yes. But know this. God is not going to bless your sin. Quit asking. It doesn't work. When God wants you to do it and you agree with His Word, it shall be done. Amen? When God wants you to do it and you agree with His word, it shall be done. Look at Exodus chapter 14. Let's look at 13 through 20. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again. No more or ever. The Lord will fight for you and shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went in behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. 
So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was the cloud and the darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all night. Moses told the people, be still and watch what God's going to do. Most of us think that God needs our help. God does not need your help. What He likes best is when you get out of His way. Let God do what God does best. God doesn't need your help. He needs your surrender. He needs your submission. Your participation is not needed when God moves. What He wants you to do is simply follow through with what He's already asked you. He had told them to go forward, and now they were standing still. God turned to Moses and said, said, Why are you crying to me? Tell the people to move forward. And then you take your staff, you hold it up, and you part the waters that are before you. God had instructed. The people had doubted. Moses is crying back to God. He's like, what have you done? God said, watch out. I'm getting ready to move. I don't need you to move. What I need is for you to obey. When God tells you to move forward and go, go. Don't wait and see if everybody else is going. One of the most common things I ever heard growing up, if your friends all jumped off a bridge, would you too? I said, absolutely not, because I'd be the first one. Who wants to be last? It's easy. easy. God was watching over your mom. I was immortal back then. Now I'm just ugly. I got a lot of scars, people, for doing some stupid things. When you watch God work, God will reveal himself in ways you never thought possible. Watch God work and work while you walk. They had one thing to do, and that was move forward. I want to ask you something today, Medellin. How many people would like to see us move forward as individuals, as families, as a body of Christ, as a community? Then you know what you got to do? Keep marching forward and just watch what God will do. Keep marching forward and just watch what God will do. It says that Moses said, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. And the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. God says, why are you crying out to me? I've already told you what to do. Tell him to get moving. When you lose your fear and you start to trust God, he's about ready to do a glorious thing in the moment. And what he does in the moment will cause a movement. Do you understand? It doesn't take all of us to be God. It takes one of us willing to obey God to move. And the rest will fall in. I'm not asking for every one of you to get up and move today. I'm asking for wherever God's calling you to get up and move today, to get up and move, and the rest of us will surely follow and come to our senses. Because all of us will behold the glory of God and the miraculous things He can do when we just get moving. Who came ready to move this morning? Who came in and said, you know what, I know it's Mother's Day, I hope we don't preach all day, I'd like to get to lunch before the restaurants fill up. Trust me, they're already full. <coughs> I tried to take Melissa early yesterday. You know what I'm saying, Harper? Like beat the rush. I took Melissa to a restaurant yesterday at 2.20. They don't open till 3. There was already a full car lot and a line out. Like markers. Like, you know, when you're at the, uh, like you go to a music park, they were forced not to be recognized. We drove to another restaurant because I felt the hostility there. Trust me, they're going to be just as full today. Harold Shaw has made arrangements to go at 5 tonight. If we can just find out where Carol Shaw's going tonight at 5, y'all get there at 4.30. We'll keep them there at 7. <laughs> it's not about me and how long I preach. You know what it's about? God's just waiting on you to move. Move in obedience. Did you know if we come into this place today and we just sang Him praises, God would move. If we came into this place today and we just simply read His Word, God will move. Sometimes we get in His way. We keep asking why. We stop getting, start getting afraid and we keep looking back to where we've been and we can't trust where He's taken us. So we miss the miraculous things that happen in life. Not only did God part the sea, they walked through on dry land. 
and every and anyone who tried to pursue them were engulfed by the waters and never made it through. He told them, don't even look at the Egyptians who you will never see again from this day forward. If you're here today and you're ready to put sin to rest, let Jesus Christ separate you from your sin by repentance, through reconciliation, and through forgiveness. And guess what? Never look for it again. He removed it as far as the east is from the west. And now that you've been free, you've been lightened in your load, get moving forward to where God's going to have you. And you say, well, where's it going to be? It may be different for every one of us. Some of us are called to serve in certain places. Some of us are called to serve in the home, the workplace, leadership, church, Sunday school. You can serve right where you're at. You can serve at your workplace. You can serve on your front porch. You can serve in your neighborhood. It's not about what you're doing. It's what God is doing through you. When you line up with God, all things are possible. Miraculous things and miracles happen every day. In verses 21 through 31, it says this. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea of the dry land and the waters were divided. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right and to their left. Verse 24 says this, It came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord took down, looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. He had troubled that army. And he took off their chariot wheels, and they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth. While the Egyptians were fleeing into it, the Lord overthrew the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Verse 29, But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall on the right and left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant. Moses. Everything that just proclaimed said God did it and man did not. Do you believe that? God did it and man did not. God could do it with them. God could do it without them. God does it because God wants to do it and what he did is he set them free. He didn't take them back to Egypt where they were. He was taking them to the promised land. And what I failed to always forget and it brings to my mind is that you know that God led them out of Egypt to the promised land, straight into the wilderness, and not everybody who he had mercy on to let loose from captivity made it to the promised land. Some of you are here today and you think, well, I go to church. I'm here on Sundays. I listen to you ramble, whatever it is you do, preacher man. I sit through these services. I hear you. When I go home, I'm just as good as anybody else. Trust me, the Bible says none of us are good. Not a single one. And what happens is this. We get caught up thinking that because we're in church, we're part of the movement. You're not part of the movement. You're part of the moment. And what happened in this moment was this. God separated His people from the people who were attacking His people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, the Scripture often talks about tares and wheat. There's a difference. Tares look like wheat until it comes time to harvest. And when it comes time to harvest, they separate the tares from the wheat. Quit proclaiming to be a follower of God if you don't believe in the miraculous of the moment and if you don't want to be a part of the movement. Many people will sit idly by and come to church and hear a message of truth straight from the Word of God. Feel the presence of God in the place but they will never change, never repent, never leave their sin and wonder why when they die they ended up in hell. Because church don't save you, God does, through Jesus Christ. And if you're here, I'm glad you're here in this moment. But understand the miraculous thing that can happen while you're here is that you can leave sin behind, be set free forever, and never return to what was trying to kill you. You can not only flee the enemy, you can escape the enemy forever. Trust me, he's not done. He's not done. He didn't just get him to the other side and everything was okay. He took them to the other side and they got thirsty. You know what they did when they got thirsty? They got complained and said, they had nothing to drink. If you've ever had a child, mothers, I know you're here today. You were just going on a seven-minute trip in your car. 
your child's out. Like, well, you, you, got, you got water out. I want water. You got a child. I want you. Well, we'll be there now. I want it now. Trust me, we get older, we still act the same. Let me get thirsty and see how I act. They started chiding Moses. They started chiding against God. They're like, we're thirsty. God's like, all right, Moses, go forward with that same staff that you used to part the sea through my power, and I want you to strike the rock. And when you strike the rock, guess what happened? Water came out of it. He not only parted the Red Sea, he caused water to come from a rock. Do you understand that the water from the rock, the rock is Jesus Christ, and the water is the living water that comes from Jesus Christ. He not only gave and quenched their thirst, he quenched their spirits. When that wasn't good enough, they got mad and said, we're not only thirsty, we're hungry. He caused manna to fall from heaven. Manna, something that no one had ever seen before. It came in particles and fell, and they made bread from it, and they ate. They had water, and they had food. And they were grateful at the time. And then soon after that, it just wasn't good enough. Some of you are sitting here today, and you've experienced the miracles of God. You've experienced them in the moment, and you've experienced them in the movement of Christianity, the movement of discipleship. And since it's been so long, you've grown weary of it as if God didn't save or rescue you or provide for you, and now you're bored and you want more. That's the most human thing we can ever do is to want more and never be content in what we have. So God sent quail. He sent meat. So they had manna. They had meat. They had water. And guess what? They still complain. You can't satisfy people. But the only way that you'll ever be satisfied is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior. Miracles will happen in ways you never thought possible. And when you see God work, stand in awe and believe in Him for greater things. You know what? I believe in miracles. I have my own reasons that I believe in miracles. And I believe in the miraculous. I believe in them in the moment. And I believe in them in the movement. But I believe God more now for bigger things than I ever thought possible because of what He's shown me in the past. My God is not set by limitations. He's not set by fences, gates, or roofs, or buildings. My God can't fit in 1188 Detroit Road. The world couldn't contain God. He's in the heavens. He designed it. He created it. He's everywhere. And you and I both will see one day that each of us bow and we will say that He is Lord. And some of us do it willingly, and some of us will wait. But I promise you, the miracle is in this. Every story in the Bible has a point. The big point is this. God always provides for your deliverance. You may not get out of the prison, but God provided Jesus. You may not get out of slavery, but God provided Jesus. You may not get out of your situation, but God provided Jesus. And do you realize when you've got Jesus, it doesn't matter about your situation? Oh, it don't matter. Some of you say, well, what about those missionaries? that are overseas and they get arrested and they torture them and then they end up dying. That's fine. They were saved. Guess where they are? In the presence of the Lord. You've got to stop basing your life about where you are and start focusing on where God is in your life. He's either on the throne or not at all. He's either the good God Almighty or He's not God at all. Stop looking for miracles and dead things. You can't save yourself. God saves you. We're all lost. We're all found guilty. And without God, we're in a world without hope. It says here, and I love this verse, but God, who was rich in mercy, allowed His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross as the ultimate price of redemption for lost sinners. That tells me this. If God never performs another miracle in my life or lifetime, the miracle of salvation is all I will ever need. Because what it does is it takes me from a sinner to a child of God. It takes me from someone who deserves death, part of the family. It takes me from being a beggar to being a son. It brings me from outside into the temple of God. It brings me from being someone wandering to I sit at the family table. I've got a spot. I've got a reserved seat. And guess what? I will glorify His name. It takes me from a nobody and makes me a somebody. Not on this earth, but in the here, earth here to come. And what is in heaven? Let me ask you something today. Truly think about this too. As we talk about the God of the moment. As we talk about the God of the movement. Is He God of your life? And if not, 
You'll never see the miraculous until you accept the miraculous exchange that comes from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying on the cross for your sins, raising from the grave three days later. And guess what? One day He's going to come and call us home. And I cannot wait for that day. If I asked you to testify on miracles today, I'm sure there'd be a variety of people stand up over a variety of different things. From what you've seen done, from the hand of God, the word of God, and the help of God. But until, until we become the children of God, none of that matters. Did you hear what I said, church? Until we become the children of God, none of that matters. The Egyptians saw miracles and still died without God. You can be part of the church and still not be sons and daughters. You can have the biggest company. You can have the largest house and several cars. You can own all the property. You can have all the cattle. You can have all the land. You can have those big fat bank accounts and none of that can buy you salvation. None of that. But once you have salvation, nothing else will ever everything. Everything else won't distract you. Nothing else will be able to take hold of it. Because where your heart is, is where your treasure is. And your treasure is the Lord. And if it's not, you'll always be tempted by what we do. What are you expecting for today, God? Who wants to see a miracle? I do. I want to see the lost saved. I want to see the saved redeemed. And I want to see all of us reconciled to God in this moment. So that God can use us for I want to see my home changed because God's at the center of it. I want to see my children rear better because I do it God's way. I want to see my spouse love better because I do it the way God tells me. I want to see my family, an extended family, from generation to generation brought up in the precepts of God. I want to be influential in my workplace for the glory of God and not so. Trust me, titles aren't always worth what they come with. Always be willing to serve God rather than serve man. I want to see my church so caught up in the Spirit of God that we are proclaiming the gospel not just with our mouth, but with our everyday life. I want to see us step up and to be that movement of God, not just at 1188 Detour Road, but right here on Detour Road in Warren County, Plum Springs, the state of Kentucky. I want to see us so caught up in the Spirit of God that we never quit moving forward until He calls us home. And as long as we're in obedience, He will part waters, He will move mountains, He will tear down strongholds, He will move and break chains of addictions, He will move everything out of the way because we are marching to Zion. Are you with me? And here's where it ends. And here's where it begins. You have two choices today. You can leave as if nothing ever happened. Or you can surrender your all and be in service. I today choose the God of this moment. And I pray that He will be the God of this moment. We no longer are who we were, but that we become everything God has called us to be. Amen. Father, in this place, I know that there's people with things on their mind, things on their heart, and there's situations that. We don't know about it. We may never know about it. But Lord, I pray that they would give them up today and turn them over to you. I would pray that they stop being distracted and they start giving in and realizing you know best. That your words aren't simply stories or parables but they're not fables. They're truth. And your truth stands the test of time. You came so that we would be free. You didn't set us free so we could return back to our sin. You set us free that we could be free. So Lord, today, as people's minds may be heavy, I pray that they would lay them at your feet. If there's someone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today be the day of salvation. For those who have professed you as Lord today, I pray that they be sweet and not a tear. But Lord, they don't just come to church, that they be a mighty move of church. The first it comes to surrender to you. But Lord, they'd be caught up, not in the miraculous, but they would believe in the miracle you already performed on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. But Lord, what you did there was more than enough. And if you never did another thing, we give you glory for that. Lord, today I know that there may be heavy hearts here. 
There may be heavy hearts for mothers who lost children. I pray peace for them, Lord. I pray comfort. Lord, I know that there may be women here today who have long been desired to be a mom and have not yet become a mom. Lord, I pray your peace and your hand upon them. But Lord, you know all, you know all reasons. Lord, sometimes just not ask why. And say, Lord, where would you have me? And sometimes you move in mighty ways. And women bring forth children, sometimes they don't. But Lord, may we be reminded that there's millions of children in this world who need a home and they need a family. Let us be willing to open our doors for our hearts for those kids. Lord, if people are here today and are struggling in their marriage, remind them that you're the only cure. If they're struggling in their finances, you're the only solution. Lord, today remind them they can come in heavy and they can leave love. But an exchange has to happen. We don't, we're not sorry. We're repentant. We choose to say, God, it's you and you alone in my sin. We confess. We repent. Lord, you forever change your life. Lord, I pray for strength for people not to return to the things you know. Lord, I pray for courage and boldness to look at things and say, you may look bigger to me than anything else, but you're not bigger than God. And stand and watch as God moves those things. From the oceans to the mountains, the valleys and hills. Lord, you can move them all things. So Lord, sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. As we're in this moment, make us part of your new In your name I pray. Amen.